Our guest this evening is the world's most successful dance choreographer. He is the creator of the world's longest running ballet production, a five-time Olivier Award winner, and the only British director to have won the Tony Award for both Best Choreographer and Best Director of a Musical. Matthew Bourne started training to be a dancer at the comparatively late age of 22. He studied dance theater and choreography at the Laban Center in London, graduating in 1985, and then danced professionally for 14 years. Mr. Bourne was the artistic director of his first company, Adventures in Motion Pictures, from 1987 to 2002. During those 15 years, AMP became the UK's most innovative and popular dance theater company, creating an enormous new audience for dance with its groundbreaking worth work both at home and internationally. Works created for AMP included The Car Man, Cinderella, and his groundbreaking all-male Swan Lake, which won numerous international awards, including <coughs> two Tony Awards and an Olivier Award. In 2002, Matthew launched his current company, New Adventures, with two highly successful productions, Play Without Words, premiered at the National Theater and went on to win the Best Entertainment Award at that year's Olivier Awards, and a new production of Nutcracker, also premiered at Sadler's Wells in 2002, became an instant popular hit with audiences and critics returning the following year for a second sellout season. Matthew has also created choreography for several major revivals of classical musicals, including Cameron McIntosh's productions of Oliver and My Fair Lady. In 2004, Matthew co-directed and choreographed the, the hit West End musical Mary Poppins, for which he won an Olivier Award for Best Theater Choreographer. It went on to premiere on Broadway in 2006, earning <coughs> Mr. Bourne another two Tony nominations and the first national tour of Mary Poppins played here at the Civic Center in 2010. Des Moines Performing Arts is, a con is part of a consortium called the Independent Presenter Network, has invested in several of Matthew Bourne's works, including The Car Man, Edward Scissorhands, and the production playing here this weekend, Sleeping Beauty. Please welcome Matthew Bourne. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you and I met for the first time about 11 years ago, when the IPN was meeting in London. Yeah. And I think I can speak for both of us to say that neither of us ever imagined that one day we would be sitting together on a stage in Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> Is that safe? That's safe to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we're really thrilled that you're here. It's great to be here. So I'd like to start by just talking with you about growing up. Um, and, and you're, you, you, I mentioned that you didn't start dancing until a later age. Yeah. But growing yeah. up in London, you went to the film, to cinema a lot? I went to the cinema a lot. I, I had parents that were big fans of movies and theatre. I was born in London, so we were around a lot of theatre, and I was lucky enough to have parents who loved the theatre. They weren't anything to do with it, but they <laughs> loved it. They were fans, you know. Um, and uh, so they took me to see things from quite a young age, and we had a lot of theatre around us. And, and cinema, obviously, on TV and at the cinema they took me to. Um, and my memory of those times, actually, is of always... It's interesting you mentioned how late I got into training, which is extraordinarily late for dancers mm -hmm. to 22. But if I think back, I always was putting on a show from a very <laughs> early age, from the age of about five onwards. Um, I would get other kids from down the street to do something uh, in the garden even or in the spare bedroom, you know, on that level at school I would do it. I formed my own dance theatre companies very early on. I had one when I was 14, one when I was 18. So I was, I was always putting on a show <clears throat> and I came across something funny the other day. I've, um, had a poster that I'd done for, for uh, one of my shows and it had at the bottom um, I always charge people to come and see it. It was just very, really interesting. <laughs> Eye on the business, you know, right from the beginning. Good. <laughs> and I had free tea and biscuits in the interval. It was, a sort of a, it was something to sort of make people want to come. Anyway. Yeah, Same thing we're doing with Sleeping Beauty, how are you? Yeah. What, what were some of the shows that you did? Do you remember? Well, what I used to do, I used to, um, as, a, as a very young kid, you know, I, I um, I used to go to the cinema and see a movie um, like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang 
or Mary Poppins or mm -hmm. a Disney movie like um, Lady and the Tramp or something. Mm -hmm. And having seen it once, I would come home and I would try and recreate it and cast all my friends in the roles. And, and I was, I would say I was always Dick Van Dyke at that. <laughs> in those years. I was always the lead. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yes. And I was generally uh, playing that role, the, the Dick Van Dyke roles. Um, so that's, that's how it came about, really. It's from, from, um, from watching and remembering. Um, and in the, the days prior to video, uh, so you couldn't really watch anything. So everything was, every, at that time, it was all self-taught through watching, I think, mainly. Were you the lady or the tramp? I was definitely the tramp. My brother, <laughs> my younger brother, always had to play the female role. He was always ginger to my Fred or something like that. You know. Poor thing. He's <laughs> He remembers it quite fondly now. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> so then you would, I read that you would travel to the West End and you attended opening nights I did. from the outside or were you in? Um, well, it was, it was interesting how this came about. I was an avid autograph collector and it came about because um, my, uh, my mum and I were big fans of Edith Evans. I don't know if anyone remembers Edith Evans. She was a big very old actress when I was young. She was, she was doing this season in London where it was e called Edith Evans and Friends. And she was uh, basically sitting in a chair and, and playing Juliet, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, yeah. things like this. She was a very famous actress, legendary actress. And we went along to see it on the, it happened to be the opening night. And uh, we didn't quite realize when all these famous people started to arrive and I got the bug, you know, when I saw, actually saw these people in the flesh and that they were in the theater and that they were real because uh, I was about 13 mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and I thought, oh, if you come up to the, if you come to the opening nights, people are, there, they're really there. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can come up and actually say hello. And so I, I started to do that and I did it all through my teen years in London. Um, and I used to go to uh, stage doors, opening nights, hotels. I was a complete pest probably, to <laughs> <laughs> a stalker maybe even. Um, no, I was very polite actually and um, uh, I think that's how I did quite well with it. I was always very, when I spoke to people, it was always Miss whoever or Mr. so-and-so. You know, I was very, very English. <laughs> what was the best experience you ever had with that? <clears throat> um, so many uh, people that I met. They're, they're lovely memories now. The actual autograph isn't so important, actually. It's the memories of knowing that I actually had that contact with people. Charlie Chaplin I met. Mm. Um, uh, Fred Astaire I met several times to the point where he recognized me and would wave at me from a car. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's that boy again. Uh, <laughs> and he was an influence, right? Very much, yeah. I think Fred Astaire's probably been the biggest influence on what I do. Um, because, um, and I've thought about this, so initially it was just, I, th I thought it was wonderful. You know, the work was wonderful and I think he's a genius choreographer, which is very rarely mentioned, you know. But I, I think what he does is, um, and has done for many generations, he's made dance um, acceptable. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he's made the world fall in love with dancing, that's what I feel, uh, and it made it seem very natural, a natural thing, the way he just starts to walk and then suddenly picks something up and starts to play with it, and it seems like something that anyone could do. And um, I try and do that in my own productions in a way. I try to ease the dance in. Um, and I think that's uh, important for audiences that it's not the thing that they normally go to watch, maybe dance uh, or ballet or whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's an, I think that's, that's the special skill that he had. And I hadn't realized it until more recent years when I thought that's, that's a very clever thing that he did there. Um, it's like that thing when people say, oh, I don't like musicals, I don't understand it when they just start singing. You know, you always right. get those people who it's not their thing. Um, and I think he was the same with dancing. He found a way of making it seem the most natural thing in the world. That's great. So you studied dance um, at a <coughs> relatively older age, mm. and then you started a company. Your first company was called Adventures in Motion Pictures. Yes, my first professional company. How did that yeah. name come about? Adventures in Motion Pictures um, came about. We, I was, um, the, the company itself was formed from students. I was at fellow students I was at college with. Mm -hmm. And in our final year, we were a performing company, but still students. And we were, at the last gig that we had was in Hong Kong at an international youth festival. And we were about to leave college and we were looking for a name. We wanted to work together still. We were flying back on 
China Airways, I think it was, and um, the plastic bag that we got our headsets in uh, had that written on it, Adventures in Motion Pictures. And uh, we all said, that's a good name, let's call it that. <laughs> and, um, and it seemed to make some kind of sense, you know, it was uh, um, motion pictures seemed to be dance, you know, um, adventures seemed to be a good a good word for something that was new and starting out, you know, a new, a new way of uh, telling stories, maybe. And um, so that's why when eventually I changed the name of the company in, uh, about 11 years ago now, uh, it became New Adventures because I, st I still wanted that adventure yeah. uh, in there, really, because it does feel like every new piece has that feeling of, of a new adventure. Sure. So when much of your earlier work... Um, I'm, I'm always fascinated because when I talk to people about musical theater, I say most musicals have some kind of source material. There are very few original musicals. Yeah. How did you choose the works that you did in your early days? It's interesting. In, that in those days, the resources were very small. It was a very small company. It was, um, there was not much money for anything, really, other than just trying to make it happen. Um, and uh, so it tended to be, in the very early days, uh, things, music that I loved. It was sort of patchwork of, of bits and pieces of, of, of recordings that I liked, existing recordings. And I would do themed pieces around an idea. So I would do a piece about Fren the French, Frenchness or whatever. <laughs> um, and I would, or, and I'd have lots of Piaf and Charles Trenet and things like that within it, and the Can Can at the end, and uh, Offenbach, and you know, so I'd, I'd mix together all these ideas, and it was like a little review. And I did a one, I did one called Town and Country, it was all about Englishness, with a bit of Noel Coward in it, a bit of Percy Granger, and a bit of Elgar, and a bit, you know, a mix of things. Um, and it was almost like uh, these are my favourite things, you know. It was it was like that. It was I wanted to share things that I'd discovered with the audience a bit. Um, and then as time went by, um, I got the bug for creating more full-length works, you know, and that was, that was something surprising for me at the time. So your first full-length Tchaikovsky ballet was Nutcracker. Yes. And why did you choose that first? Well, I didn't choose it. I mean, <laughs> I, as I say, when, we, when I was asked to do it as a commission, ah. um, and we were, at the time, we were a company of six dancers, one of which was myself, doing very small scale touring out of a minibus. Um, so you're not going to think of doing Nutcracker or anything like that. Right. You know, it just doesn't cross your mind. Um, but this company called Opera North, who are a, a, a big opera company in the northern part of England, um, wanted to do a program in which they would uh, recreate the program on which Nutcracker was originally premiered. It was the centenary of Nutcracker. And it was originally premiered with a one-act opera by Tchaikovsky as well, called Yolande. And they wanted to do the opera, and they wanted a dance company to do uh, a new version of the Nutcracker. And very bravely, actually, if I think back now, they asked me to do it. And I, this was, uh, I had no track record whatsoever. But we had a sort of quirky reputation for, for humour and, and, and um, audience appeal, you know, in a small way for the sort of work that we were doing. And they gave me this opportunity to do a large-scale piece and we, we, we could grow at that point into a larger company with them, with a full orchestra and all the resources and the budget that that would give us. And um, it was something that n had never occurred to me when it was put to me. I loved it. I loved the Nutcracker. I loved all the ballets I used to go and see, and I was a fan, but it, would, it never crossed my mind that that's mm. something I would ever do. And it, it took me aback initially when I was asked, and then really quickly afterwards I thought, I'd absolutely love to do that, you know, and it, so it's, that's how it started. What came next then? Was it well, next, um, the success of that, it went, rather, it went quite well, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, there was talk about should I do another one of, <laughs> of a similar kind, would, would we get the funding to do another one? Um, and, but in the meantime, we had another booking, in a sense, to do another tour of our small-scale company. And I, because I'd loved doing uh, Nutcracker, I looked to find another full-length score to work on. And I did a piece called Highland Fling, mm. um, which was a version of La Sylphide, the, the, fa the, the oldest ballet that's still performed, actually. Um, and I used that entire score from beginning to end, and I created my own version of, 
of that, set in modern day Scotland. Because it, it takes place in Scotland, right? Really it's a Scottish yeah, ballet, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a right. Scottish themed ballet. And um, uh, I did my own version of it. It was a bit like the people said at the, mo at the time, it was like train spotting, that movie, you know, in the book. Uh, train spotting the ballet, they called it, uh, in a lot of reviews. Um, and um, it sort of worked really well with the story, you know, and it was a reasonably straightforward version of that, that piece. But then that came in between Nutcracker and Swan Lake. And Swan Lake was the one that I, probably if I'd been asked at the time, which would you like to do first, it prob I would probably would have said Swan Lake, because I'd watched it for many years. And um, so that was, that was the order in which they came. And Swan Lake was the one that, that changed everything, really, for me. It, it changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Mm. I mean, it was really a groundbreaking. How did you come up with the, the initial concept? I mean, was that something that was um, integral to this from the very beginning, or did it evolve? Well, it's, um, I guess what I've always felt is that if I'm going to tackle anything like that, this much hallowed, loved piece, you know, which is virtually everything I've ever done, is always had that sort of attached to it, I, I have to do something different enough with it to, uh, for people to know that it's not the original and that it's different and that it, it sort of has to wipe away the memory uh, in a way or the images that people have in their mind of that piece. So the idea of male swans seemed to be strong enough as an idea to say this is different, you know, this is, this is not what you expect. Um, and the other idea that was very strong at the time I made it in 1995 was a royal scandal, uh, right. in, which was in the press every single day in the UK, probably here as well, I don't know, that it was Charles, Diana, Camilla, Fergie, all the characters that we had known and loved. Um, and th this was a daily thing in the press, you know. And there's something about the story of Swan Lake, the ballet of Swan Lake, which is about a troubled prince who can't marry the, the person he wants to. Um, and he has a mother who's trying to marry him off to a suitable princess. This is all in the ballet. It's not, nothing I made up. Right. You know, that is the ballet, the story of the ballet. And it is rather odd, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's things going on in the ballet. That it's a, um, the father doesn't exist, there's no father, it's just the queen, the queen and the, her son. And um, she keeps saying, you know, you must get married. She keeps pointing to the married, you know, finger, the ring finger. And he goes, no, 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 you know, I, I want something else, <laughs> mother, and all this sort of thing. So there's something in the ballet already that I, that I clicked into, I think. Um, so that was the initial thought to do it. Uh, I must say, though, that in the build-up to it, there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what it would be, and ex expectations were very mixed, I should say. Um, some people thought it was going to be a big send-up and a, a joke, you know, a laugh. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun and just a, a laugh. Uh, other people were cautioning me that it's, you know, it's a, tr you know, it's a tragedy, you know, it's a, you know, you're not going to mess it up, are you? And, you know, didn't think I was the person to do it necessarily. Um, some people wouldn't put money into it when they heard out what the idea of it was. One well-known designer turned it down when they knew what the idea was. Um, so we were working with something that was quite uh, uh, edgy in a way. But I think in the room when we were making it, we all felt there was a, there was a sort of a, a quiet confidence about that we thought we had something interesting to show people. Not confidence in that this was going to be a big hit or anything like that, you know, not that kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. So just to, like, I think we've got something here, and everyone felt it, um, and we got on and did it, you know. And it's still being performed, I mean. It's in rehearsal as we speak, you know. Yeah. It's, in, in, it's back, coming back in the UK, and it's in rehearsal at the moment with a whole flock of new swans. <laughs> <laughs> and recently shown in the movie theaters here, uh, in mm. HD, so I know it's... It was filmed yeah. in 3D. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and one of the lovely things about it now, with this new cast that we've got, it's um, uh, because it's now 18 years old, a lot of the dancers who are in it, um, this was the reason why they got into dancing when they saw this piece. They, as young men, they, they, they saw this piece up on stage and that was the dis deciding factor for them about wanting to, a career in dance. And now they're in the show. That's amazing. Uh, which is, is an amazing feeling. Yeah to Absolutely. have, you know, when you've got that much commitment from people. It's their, their 
ultimate dream is to be in this show. So really it's cool. great. Really cool. I'd like to talk just about your process of creating works because you have a very unique way um, of doing it, starting with your idea phase and then these workshops. Could yeah. you kind of describe that a little bit? Well, I, yeah, it's something that's developed over the years, this storytelling th um, without words. And it, it's a mix of things. It, it, um, first and foremost, they have to be dancers You know, the, the, that I work with. They have to be trained dancers. They're not necessarily trained actors, but it is something they need to learn and, and build upon as they work with me. Um, I get them to do lots of research um, before we start on the subject or the story or the, the films maybe that may be of interest around that story. Um, I get them to do their own research as well as the, the mm -hmm. stuff that I've given them. Um, I, I tend to write a story um, that is like a, it just reads like a story, once upon a time, blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. No stage directions or anything, so that people have something to grab onto. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just start to work in the studio, and it's, it's very interesting that, you know, for a play or a musical, you can read the script on day one. You can come into the room and sit in a circle, which most productions do, mm -hmm. On the first day, you sit around in a circle and you read, you read it together. And it's, for me, that feels like, wow, that's amazing. You've, that's 50% of the work done. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's already a great piece, usually, you know, if you're working with a great play or a musical. Uh, dance starts with nothing. You know, you, you, you've got to feed the, the people you're working with to be able to create, because they need to be involved in that, for me, anyway. I'm not right. a dictatorial creator in that way. So... Um, it's something we work together on in the room, you know, in, in the rehearsal room, and we, I, I, I use them very much today uh, on, on how to create the, the work and, and use what they have rather than what I necessarily have as a, a mover. Um, and it organically comes about, you know, eventually. But it's an it's a unusual process for dancers to be involved in so much uh, research and so much um, where... I want to hear what they have to say about it. I think dancers historically have been, you know, the, the way to be is to, is to be told what to do and to be polite and quiet and just do as you're told. And I found that recently when we recreated one of our pieces on Scottish ballet, the, the, the National Ballet of Scotland. Um, and we did, it was Highland Fling, actually, the piece we were talking about earlier. And that was the initial thing in the room was that they, they are very nice, very, very polite and very just waited to be this told, you know, and I, I, I'd forgotten that that was the case, you know, <laughs> because I want a room of people thinking and being creative, and um, eventually they did get it, and they loved it, you know, they loved that, that they, in fact, they could have ideas about it, and that may change the piece, um, but it's, that's the kind of um, world I try to create, and I, obviously, I've missed out a whole big chunk, which is working with designers and... Yeah, that uh, was the part I wanted to talk yeah. about. You've, you have collaborators you've worked with for many years. Yes. Yeah, uh, Les Brotherston being the main one who's designed Sleeping Beauty, and um, uh, he's he, he and I have been working together for nearly twenty years now, and um, this is central to what we what I do now with storytelling. Uh, he's the first person I go to with the idea, and that's something that will be fully realised before the dancers even come into the room. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's. Um, it has to be, because it's already usually being made <laughs> by the time they come into the picture. Right. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's great to find collaborators that you feel this, uh, you feel very sympathetic with, you know, and you, you abs absolutely have a, um, a language that works together. Um, and it doesn't mean we do have the same ideas, interestingly. It, it, sometimes we surprise each other, you know, and he'll show me something that I would never have thought of. It's not that kind of, you know, we all think the same. It's not that at all. It's any collaboration, I think, is good when people surprise you. Same with composers I've worked with, you know. Sometimes the thing that, that arrives, the piece, is like, really? Oh, okay. Well, let's try it, you know, and it's, <laughs> it, I, I love that. And in this piece, of course, with Tchaikovsky being dead, he's not going to bring you anything <laughs> more, but um, yeah. you recorded this score for this separately, which yeah. you've done with most, if not all, of your Yes, ballads. some of our other ones, yeah. And do you make little <clears throat> cuts and changes or move around things ever? 
Well, it's, I do a little bit. Okay. I try and be, uh, with music, I'm very conscious that I'm taking something that already exists. But with these famous uh, ballets, they're already always a bit different anyway. Whenever you see any production of Swan Lake or Sleeping Beauty, they have bits in them that sometimes there and sometimes not. Um, all ballet companies choose the version that they're going to do. So this, uh, it's, there's no sort of set version of it. Right. Some sections of it, uh, definitely. But I try and be as reverential as possible musically. Um, but one of the things, the reasons why we do create our own version of it is because um, it, this is very interesting for ballet, any ballet fans here, is that the music has got slower and slower and slower over the years and to the point where it's, it can be the most dreary ballet in the world um, to watch now, and I, th I thought, what is, what's wrong with this? What's, what's, um, why is this piece not working anymore? When I saw it at the, mm -hmm. the Royal Ballet, which is where mm -hmm. I go, if I go to ballet in in London, um, <laughs> and luckily somebody sent me a, a recording of it uh, from 1978, a, a, a video that was uh, actually a gala performance that was broadcast here uh, from Covent Garden. And um, this, that was the version I fell in love with. And that was, it was fast moving, it was witty, it was dramatic. Uh, but most importantly, every single tempo, tem all the tempi were faster. And so to be able to recreate that score now um, at the tempi that Tchaikovsky intended it to be is one of the things that I feel very strongly about. And I feel that oddly, our version is more authentic musically than the classical ballet now. And our Swan Lake as well. <laughs> Before we talk about Sleeping Beauty, I just want to bring up one, want to go back to the cinema and film, because I've, I've read bits and pieces that you, you, you kind of incorporate film into your works. Yes. And, and, and one of the things I was thinking about last night was, I'm a big Hitchcock fan, mm, and I think too. you are too. And mm. The thing I noticed about that the two of you do that are in, is in common is kind of building the structure, getting the sets, the costumes, everything, and then asking the, the actors or the dancers to really do their craft. You yes. know, as opposed, like you said, as opposed to just telling them what to do. I, you know, Alfred Hitchcock would say, "Here's the script, go do it." Yeah. Um, which I admire, I think, and yeah. that's um, if you cast me, well. Yeah, you've got to cast the right people. Yeah. <laughs> but film, how does that play into what you do? Well, I guess this, my head is full of film images, you know, and that, so that comes out naturally. Sometimes I can't remember where they've come from. Um, and it's visual storytelling often, and Hitchcock is one of the masters of that, obviously, with long sequences of mm -hmm. film where they, there's not much dialogue, pure cinema obviously appeals to me, and silent movies have always appealed to me because I feel that's something very similar to what I do. So, but um, beyond that, I found it very uh, uh, very good for dancers, actually, because it's, it's interesting working with dancers as actors because they uh, don't think necessarily like actors would. I mean, you would never tell a dancer to go and watch this actor in this film to get an idea of how to play this particular role. And I do that all the time with them. <laughs> you know, in The Car Man, for example, I would say to the guy, go and watch Marlon Brando in Streetcar Named Desire, you know, then you get it. Mm -hmm. I would never say that to an actor because, you know, they would be so offended, like watch another actor to learn how to act, you know. Right. But because that's not their first skill, they're very, oh yes, I will. And you know, they go and watch it and they say, oh, I get it now, it's great. You know, I've got so many ideas now from watching that. Um, the f even just the physicality. Um, so it's been helpful in that respect, but people are often surprised with things like um, uh, Swan Lake, that one of the influences was the birds, Alfred Hitchcock's The mm -hmm. Birds, and it's so obvious when I say it, <laughs> in a way, uh, particularly in our act four, at the end of our piece, where the swans sort of turn on the prince and the main swan and they, they attack them. Uh, the swans turn savage, in a way, uh, very much like that film, right. poor old Tippy Hedron at the end yeah, of the film. Right that's where it comes from, you know. And I, I happened to catch The Lady Vanishes the other day, and one of the characters on the train looks a lot like one of your characters in Sleeping Beauty, the nanny, I think. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. I hadn't thought about that, but that's interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Lady Vanishes. But the thing you said about Hitchcock, the thing that's interesting about um, he, what I've, 
always loved about him. There's an all, he's an all-round entertainer in a way. He's famous for the thrills and the suspense, is what everyone says, but also humor. He, all the films have humor in them. They're all very glamorous as well. They all have uh, they're, they're star power, you know, that kind of thing. All those things that I love as well, I think, about telling stories. Um, it's not just, oh, Hitchcock, he does suspense. I think he's, uh, it's an all-round entertainment that you get, complete entertainment. Well, and dance, you, you really are the embodiment of dance as entertainment, going back to what it was many, many years ago. And well, I think dance is, it, as we were saying earlier, dance is theater. And yeah. People s separate them sometimes, and they, um, I don't understand that at all. Um, when people say, well, it's a, it, I had this argument a while back in New York with, with which theater critics, which theater or dance critics would come to see the show, and they all argued with each other, saying it's not dance, it's theater, and it's not theater, it's dance. And <laughs> like saying, well, actually, <laughs> can't we just agree that yeah. it's both? You yeah, know, it's, right. it, it, all dance is theater, I think. <laughs> that's right. so. Sleeping Beauty. Um, so the, you went back to kind of the original story telling, or the, there's no real original story. No, there's several. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Going back to the France, it was very dark, the original, some of the 1600s, was it? Yes. Um, well, there's a, there's a grim version, the grim version. But before version. that. There's an earlier version, yes, the very ancient version. There's versions of it that you, where you get elements of it um, as a sort of myth, you know. Um, and there are versions that I'd never even heard of, you know. But uh, the, the most well-known versions, I guess, today are either the Grimm version uh, or the Disney uh, or the ballet. Right. You know, they're the three most famous versions, I would say, today, and they're the ones, you know, I looked at the most. And differences, obviously, Disney, she doesn't sleep for 100 years. No. I quite liked the fact, when I discovered that, which hadn't really occurred to me, because we, you, when you're watching it, you don't really realize it, but I liked the fact that Disney took a look at it as a story and thought, well, what, is it, what, what works about this and what doesn't work? And that's exactly what I did. And I hadn't realized until I went back to the film and said, oh, she actually meets the prince earlier on in the story, mm. in the Disney. That's not in the original story. She thinks she's you know, with a commoner that she meets in the forest. He actually is a prince. And he eventually saves her very shortly after she goes to sleep, not 100 years later. Right, right. <laughs> but I've actually tried to encapsulate that story with the 100 years sleep as well. But she does already have someone that she's in love with at the beginning of the piece. And that came, interestingly, Disney saw the same problem with the story that I saw, I think. So before we, we're going to take uh, some questions from all of you, but we had a screening of a BBC documentary a week ago, which was uh, called A Beauty is Born. Yeah. And there were a handful of questions that came from uh, some of the audience members that uh, we wanted to ask you. Um, right. First one is about how many original company members are performing in the North American tour? Um, all. <laughs> I mean, we've had, we've had two people leave for different personal reasons, but basically it's the original, the full original company. And this opened in October of last year yes. uh, in Plymouth and then toured the UK and then went to London. Uh, it just started with a little bit of a, a UK tour, eight weeks in London at Sadler's Wells, um, and then a big UK tour. Then it went to Italy and Russia, Moscow. Moscow were the last dates we did before here. And that was in June. That's typical routing tour, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Moscow to Des Moines. Yeah. yeah. We're used to that. <laughs> and we'd done over 200 performances by that point. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, what part of the production was the most challenging to work through? Um, I think, I think uh, for me, the, most, the biggest challenge uh, with anything like this is, is the fact that it's very well known. And, for some people, um, you're dealing with something that's much loved. And I, as I said earlier, and I think it's, you have to be careful when you do that. Um, that's a challenge always, to please the people who already love the piece, and also to please the people who don't know anything about the piece, and have never seen the ballet or read the story, have got a vague idea it's about a girl who goes to sleep for 100 years or whatever. You know, that's, I want to please everyone. And that's the challenge, I think, is trying to make it work on levels for everyone. But you are so amazing in that you truly program for people who know nothing about Yes. It. I mean, you really are a storyteller. 
Yeah. And so yeah. you don't have program notes no. in the in the which I think is is admirable. And I've seen a lot of your work, and I've always understood where we're going with it, and have always loved it. Cinderella, after Sleeping Beauty, I think Cinderella is my second favorite. I love that production. I hope you bring that to the United States. Uh, I'd love to. We love. I love that production. But it's yeah. I don't have scenario. I don't have scenarios. Sorry, folks, in the program. Before. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but don't worry, you'll you'll yeah. be able to follow it. <laughs> Are there any parts that you're anxious to see how United States audiences respond to? Well, it's interesting. We're just dying for a response after Russia because they don't react. <laughs> <laughs> any response would be good. Um, well, it was their music originally, so they're probably. You know. They love it, but they don't react to anything it's sort of silence you know throughout and um, we're a company that loves reaction so and you know we're so excited about being here because we know that that's not going to be a problem here in the states you know so we know we're looking forward to it but uh, you know we like laughs we like applause in whenever people want to it we it, we're, we respond to that yeah so we're excited about that and I, I think it's safe one of the questions was are there any modifications to the set or the choreography to the tour in the United States, other than new lighting, just because of the voltage, I think. Oh, really? I didn't know about that. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> voltage lighting issues. Lighting instruments. I mean, it's, oh, right. we have a different voltage here. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I mean, we've, we've we've honed the production. It was interesting for me for all of of all my productions. It's the one that came together the quickest, earliest in its run. Normally, I always want to do things. So I went to wait for the next time it's revived to to do a big change or something. This one, it just sort of gelled for me. Uh, and I've done little things along the way, and we have done some small changes, you know, um, that have, have made it better. And we did a few last week when we were rehearsing in, in London, little things. Um, and we might, you know, it's interesting you say that, we might talk about this after having done some shows this week. You know, when we hear the reaction or feel the reaction of the, of the audience, we may say, oh, look, people like that aspect of it. Let's, or we can pull back there a little bit because, you know, mm -hmm. um, or maybe our timing's off a bit here. They didn't really get that moment. We do talk about it with new audiences always afterwards and then possibly change things for the audience because um, it's very important to me that people get it and uh, yeah. enjoy it, you know. That's great. Okay. Who has a question <laughs> here? We have, oh, my God, Val. How are you? <laughs> Sure. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah? The question was about um, making the transition from a six-person uh, company to a larger company. How did you find them? How did yeah. you audition them? Well, it was, um, at the time, we were a less well-known company, obviously, you know, and uh, it was quite hard to get that many people together on the scene who weren't already in companies and things, and it was done through auditions in London uh, and some people we already knew maybe but it was um, in those days and even with the original Swan Lake company that was quite hard to find as that many men to be in the in the production now it's hundreds of people apply for it you know um, but it's um, it, it was it was harder then and I think um, one of the things that uh, we found initially as a company that was different was the amount of shows we were doing. Interestingly, it wasn't so much about, I mean, the dance, finding the dances were difficult, but doing that many performances, uh, particularly later on when we went into Swan Lake, um, doing seven or eight shows a week, it was not something anyone was used to at all as dancers. They were concert dancers, as you would call them here, I think. They were dancers from com company dancers, uh, not West End or Broadway type dancers who were used to that kind of schedule. And this was, um, quite hard work initially, Diff I mean difficult to make it work. We didn't have enough people in the company. People would get ill, people would get injured, and the, we, we've come up with a, a method now which works extremely well where we rotate our dancers' income. So they're, they're not on for every single show, they uh, have some shows off, we have, everyone does two or three roles within the production, so we can, we can make it work always. But the early days of that, going from a six to a 20, then to a 40 for Swan Lake, uh, was extremely challenging uh, for us as a group. It was a, a wonderful experience, but a really 
difficult one at the same time for a, for a while. Jamie, if we could get the house lights up just a little higher. I can't see everyone here, but no. so we'll take a question right up front here. First. Well, I, I have two questions, but I was wondering, do you, have you noticed the difference? Because you choreographed to Mary Poppins and then as well, uh, more ballet type. Have you noticed the difference between the two? And then as well, can I have your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very cruel if I said no <laughs> afterwards. So the question yeah. is the difference between uh, choreographing a musical and ballet, is that, and then uh, also if he could get Matthew's autograph, to which he's, <laughs> which he's tentatively said after. yes. Um, well, there's, there's lots of differences. I don't know what you, do you mean about the performers themselves? I mean, I found initially, yes, but I found that those things have, have changed over the years. I think musical theatre performers now, the standard of dancing is, is much higher than when I first started out with my company. And um, I get a lot of people now from musical theatre colleges and, and schools, as well as the classical schools and the contemporary schools. There's a real mix in my company of training, different training. And some of these people that you will see this week are have been in musicals. Um, and the, the main difference in actually working in, in musical theatre and, and with my own company is um, it, you, in a musical you get a, a mixed ability uh, of the performers. You get the dancers who are very good dancers who sing pretty well and you get the singers who move a bit and you get the actors who can barely do anything <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> or you get the character people who are <laughs> different sizes and shapes and things who want, who want to dance and be involved. I mean, a good musical theatre choreography will involve everyone, I think, in it, and not just say, like, oh, now the dancers take over. You know, it's, what, it's, it's the community of that show and that story. Um, and those things, I think people enjoy watching that. But you have to choreograph on levels, at different levels. Um, that's different. And usually you have to teach it a bit more, uh, know what you're doing. Whereas with my dance company, it evolves, and I work with the, the performers, because they're a little bit more... In, uh, on a different level of uh, uh, creativity in some ways. You know, that that's the, they want to express something themselves through what they do. So it's a, it, they're different, but I think they're coming together closer now. Yeah. Yes. What generation do you feel you're coming out of? The 70s, the 80s, the 90s? And what influenced you the most? The question was, what generation do you feel like you're coming out of, 70s, 80s, or 90s, and what influenced you the most? <laughs> Are you trying to find out how old I am? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I grew up in this. I was born in 1960, so I, I, uh, I grew up in that period, 60s, 70s. Um, I wouldn't say that was they were eras that I particularly, the 70s, I don't think I loved that much to still. Um, I think I was always, oddly, quite retro in my tastes when I was growing up. I loved old movies, and I loved um, uh, the sort of golden age of composers, you know, Gershwin and Rodgers and Hart and all that sort of thing. I always loved all that. Um, and I loved old movies on TV and things like that. So I think in a way, although I'm from that, it, when I was actually born is that era, but I think I, my heart was in an earlier time, for a long time. Um, and I kind of reveled in that. I liked the fact I was different like that. I always, at school, I always felt Everyone was into the current thing, and I always used to think, well, I, li I like what's already happened in the past, you know, in a way, and I, I would discover things from the past, and there was always so many discoveries to make. Um, so I still feel that a, a bit now, you know. I, it's more difficult to reflect your own time, I think. I have tried that a few times in pieces. I find that more, much more challenging than, than looking back to a, a, an era or a period. Um, but I'm open to it, you know. You are an amazing storyteller, and we uh, seriously, you are wonderful. And if you, for those of you who have never seen any of his works, um, unfortunately, we haven't presented any until this weekend when we rectify that with Sleeping Beauty. So, thank you all for coming tonight. We're so happy to have you here. And Matthew, thank you for taking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.